Hello and welcome to the Game of the Year pre-show for the 2023 New York Game Awards. I'm here with an illustrious panel, as always. My name is Simit Sarkar. I'm from Polygon, and I have with me Carolyn Pettit from Kotaku. Hey. Cherie Smith from Laptop Mag. Hey there. Dan Ackerman from CNET. Hey guys. And Jordan Miner from PC Mag. What's up? Hello. We're coming for you. They always are. One yeah. of us. <laughs> they haven't got me yet. Uh, New York, baby. Yep. New York the authenticity. Mm -hmm. City never sleeps. Uh, we're here to talk about the games of the year for 2022. Last year, uh, we've got a great crop of nominees for the New York Game Awards. The uh, um, a great crop of eight nominees. Uh, so I'm going to read through them, and then I'll start a discussion among our panel, and, and we can talk about those games and maybe some other ones too. So first, we have Vampire Survivors. Then there's Immortality, Elden Ring, Cult of the Lamb, A Plague Tale Requiem, Pentiment, God of War Ragnarok, and Xenoblade Chronicles 3. That's quite a list, folks. Uh, I'm curious for some some favorites among them. Obviously, these were all determined by the, the entire critic circle, but uh, we are all our own people here, and we, you know we have our, our preferences and things like that. Uh, so, Cherie, I'll start with you. Uh, what's one game on this list, or maybe a couple that really stood out to you? Um, right now, like I am finishing up my run through of God of War. Uh, for it just. I, life has life found a way to get in my way of finishing this game, but I am thoroughly enjoying the journey. Um, I definitely have been intrigued by immortality, and of course, Elden Ring. Who hasn't been like? I, I found some time for Elden Ring, not the time that I want, but I will be making time over the break. I am really, really excited about those games. Carolina, I, mm -hmm. Carolyn, I know that you also have been making time for God of War Ragnarok yeah. uh, getting near the end. Is that right? Yeah, well, uh, so, you know, unsurprisingly, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that you can roll credits in Ragnarok and continue playing because there's just so much extra, you know, there's so many, much, so much, maybe too much. You know, I would say maybe a little too much, but I want to say what I what I particularly really appreciate and admire about Ragnarok probably is less its design personally, uh, and more it's narrative because, um, you know, narratively it does something, you know, in the end, um, there is like a character who is really shattered by like grief and anger. And it doesn't try to like tie a neat little bow on it. It doesn't try to like resolve it. It just leaves it as this like lingering thing where this character is is just really messed up and you know I, I, to me i found that really like refreshing and and powerful that the writers of that game didn't try to um didn't try to let yeah kind of you know neatly resolve it give it a, a tie a, tie a bow around it but just kind of let us all sit with with the reality of hey sometimes people are just like haunted or broken by grief and that's kind of just the you know a thing they have to live with yeah, and, and I think we're going to have to live with that because my understanding is that that's going to be it's just that uh, game and tw the 2018 game in this sort of series here. I don't right. think there's going to be another game, at least at this point. That's my understanding, uh, not in the not in the Norse. Yeah, certainly a, a great note narratively uh, for them to go out on mm -hmm. um, uh, from the, you know, quadruple <laughs> in that game. A lot of writing there. Um, but, you know, what what is what has really brought you in? Uh, to to Pentiment. Now that's an interesting one. Now, as you know, I often have a, a minority opinion on a lot of these things, uh, so I, I'm not as enthralled about you know God of War and Elden Ring uh, as as everybody else. But I thought uh, Pentiment was really. I didn't think I was going to like it because I've seen other sort of uh, almost Monty Python esque <laughs> um, you know medieval illustration uh, games before. Uh, but once I saw how deep it was and what a kind of uh, story, kind of like a, a Name of the Rose, Cadfell uh, kind of story, uh, then you go, oh, I really got to play this. And, you know, so far, I, I got to say it, it really does live up to that, um, almost in the same way that it's almost a series of games I fall. Uh, so between those two, I think you have kind of the unusual angle covered uh, and you see some freshness. And I love that these games came to Game Pass, which I think really increases the audience for them. 
Yeah, uh, it sounds like um, Pentiment's been huge uh, on Game Pass, and that I think is a great, uh, as you're saying, a great use case for that service because uh, you know even uh, as you said yourself, kind of um, a type of game that if you you look at it, mm-hmm. if it just you know comes across your desktop, you might be a little confused and and not necessarily want to try it. But if it's part of your subscription and just sitting there in the library, you might be inclined to give it a whirl and and then all of a sudden fall into it. It's just like, uh, you know, some of the games on Game Pass are kind of like sci-fi channel movies. There's just a lot of, like, bloatware in there, but sometimes you find an undiscovered gem. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, now, if, if we... Yeah, I feel like we, we can't not talk about Elden Ring. Some people have mentioned it already. I, I, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about what brought folks into it, what, uh, you know, whether it was George R. R. Martin or whether it was the the sort of souls born lineage. Um, Jordan, are, are you an Elden Ring guy? Have you really gotten into that, uh, that lore that's under the surface a little bit? That's yeah, I'm great. I'm a great person to ask about Elden Ring. Um, I have hated souls games this whole decade. Um, souls games, Sekiro, Bloodborne. I don't like any of those games at all. I find their whole design philosophy obnoxious. Um, Elden Ring is the closest I have come to liking one of them though. Um, because the open world that they've, that they've made to put that stuff in, um, I think is astounding. The, the freedom that you have to, to kind of pursue things at your own leisure, just the amount of cool stuff that you can see in that game um, is really wild. Um, it's a really fantastic Steam Deck game, which I was not expecting at all. Um, that's how I played a lot of it. Um, so I made a, a real effort. I played like hours and hours of that game. I made a real effort to try to get... And also, like, I, don't, I don't think that you know, some of these people who are so passionate about these games are like wrong or misguided right you know, aspects of how it really is about you to, to like, just commit to what you're doing and, you know, you're going to get punished. But, like, if you keep going at it and at it, um, you know, you will, we'll get there. But, I, you know, I, I, st- I still don't like it. Even if it's the closest <laughs> I've come to liking them, oh, it's still not a I'm, I'm so um, relieved to hear someone else say that, that I didn't have to say it first. I agree, Jordan, with mm-hmm. every single word that you were saying. Mm-hmm. These are well-made games, but I am a grown man with a job, and I can't play anywhere. I can't pause it. It's just, it's, it just doesn't fit the The best game of the year, that's not Elden Ring. Okay, we, we got that one covered. We all agree on that. Let's move on. Yeah, I mean, like, I had the same problem with Monster Hunter. For, you know, they're on the right trajectory, at least. But this was not, this didn't, this didn't quite do it. Okay, but it sounds like Sheree might have some, some more to say about Elden Ring. I, I don't understand how you don't like Souls for games. That, that's <laughs> hurtful. They're, they're, <laughs> they're moody. They're beautiful. There's yeah. so much lore written in there and, like, the exploration. And, yes, yes, the battles are hard. Isn't life hard? But don't you have to get up and keep trying again? And, like, that endorphin rush when you fight, like, it's, fight, it's turning you into a fine tuned hold machine that when you finally overcome that obstacle it's just that much sweeter and i think that's why i i love a good soul board game They're like are you frustrated yeah do i want to rage quit sometimes and throw the controller yes do i do it no nah, to be throwing around equipment and b it's like you just gotta knuckle down and get through it and you're you're just better for it and it, like it just gives this sense of accomplishment when you're done and i like mm-hmm. i've been loving elden ring and i love that more and more people are getting it like it it takes me back because i'm an 80s baby like you didn't have there was there were no cheat codes for a long time yes had to muscle through right uh, and just figure it out like how many quarters did teenage teenage mutant ninja turtles eat the simpsons just like like contra all these games it just brings that back for Mm -hmm. me so i'm always going to be down with a souls board game but but Sri, you are a high powered media executive. What do you do when you're playing and like you get like an urgent slack and you're right in the middle of something? Well, I don't sleep, so like typically I like I like I am nocturnal by nature, so when every everything is done, like I am the only one awake in my house. I have no kids. I'm just like, yes, take all of my time. It's fun. Huh. Legit. I, th- Legit. I think the fact that it's willing to not be liked by everyone is very admirable, right. actually. I think that's very cool and I respect that a lot. But you know that means I'm I'm perfectly willing to be left by the wayside, um, rather than ha- be a game that is so desperate to be like everything to all people. I think the, the cultural sensation that was Millennia this year and the way people rallied around Millennia as a boss speaks to I think how 
these games are more than just, I mean, the difficulty is intrinsic to what they are, but, but people were responding to more than just the difficulty of millennia. They were responding mm. to the lore. They were responding to like her image, like the, the figure she cuts, like there are all these reasons why she's, why she came to loom large in the gamer, you know, consciousness this year. And I think that really speaks to the richness with which, you know, worlds and their bosses with this kind of, this the fighting for something or you know even if it's like fallen ideals and this ruined world so yeah i think absolutely magnificent for me yeah uh now i know jordan mentioned the steam deck earlier mm. uh, another uh you know older handheld that people may be familiar with the nintendo switch uh <laughs> is, is out there um one of our, our uh, you know, Game of the Year nominees is uh, a Switch exclusive. That's mm. Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm curious, uh, uh, Caroline, I think, you know, you came from, from what I gather. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, to, and I'll, to be fair, I have only scratched the surface. I mean, I think I've spent about 10 hours in it, and I can tell that it's, it's still just barely getting the the narrative like really underway, but already it it has laid the groundwork with these just deep, deep, like soulful themes of, um, I, I mean, well, you know, we had a great piece um, written by um, a freelancer on Kotaku that went into how uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is like the pinnacle of all of these artistic themes and ideals that have been uh, in the works since um like um since like xeno gears and like this whole the xeno saga like mm -hmm. all of these games and so yeah xenoblade chronicles 3 again like uh, i i need to spend more time with it myself to speak knowledgeably from personal experience but it really feels like just um uh, a, a grand epic jrpg in the in the classic tradition that you know has uh kind of um larger than life meaning i mean it, it, people joke about like um dethroning god you know it's kind of one of those games where like you're basically ultimately probably going to like dethrone god in some symbolic or real way and um yeah it just feels so well done the world is so gorgeous the monsters you know roaming the world are so huge and and dramatic and the relationship between your characters is Im immediately like captivating it starts off very antagonistic you have um uh, characters from like two different rival um you know uh basically nations but but they're thrown together by circumstance and you can tell that they're really going to uh see have, have the the veil drawn back from their eyes and see the truth and come together to fight uh for justice and it, it's it's very stirring stuff well, I mean that's that's a great argument for it. I guess I'll I'll have to I'll have to check it out. Mm. Uh, and and I mean, you um, should check it out because it's a JRPG, and those are awesome. They're again <laughs> beautiful, beautifully written. Like law, I have a thing with long games. Like I have no time giving like a hundred hours of my life. Sure, take it. It's fine. Like they, they, they're all more often than not they're a pleasant romp, and I'm I'm so excited. To, this is on my list after I work through Elden Ring. Like you know, I'm just not going to be doing anything in my free time. It's fine. I'll see you eventually. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to something Submit said at the very beginning of this, where he mentioned the Steam Deck. Where thinking about what you just said right now, I would put this above in level of importance and level of sheer joy. It's brought me above any of the games on this best game of the year list. In fact, it, it literally sits right next to me here mm -hmm. uh, at hey. my desk. I'll look hey. at my yeah, oh, you know what? game of the year is the Steam Deck <laughs> and whatever you want to play on it. Here, here. It, it, I it's been that. it's it's been really really great. Um, and it uh, from what I hear from folks, uh, it's it's a great platform for a game like Vampire Survivors. Yes. Yes. I think Vampire Survivors, if if I'm not mistaken, has often been the number one game played in terms of sheer hours on the Steam Deck. And it's, you know, it's easy to see why, I think. And Vampire Survivors is is such a great um it's just like a pure video game in the sense of just like big numbers, you know, d harvesting hundreds of enemies. And I'm often suspicious of games that just shower you with rewards and make you uber powerful. But Vampire Survivors is so like pure and unapologetic and honest about it. And also there's a genuine sense of discovery in making progress and finding out like, what does this next weapon fusion do? Oh my God, that like hard, that you 
you know, massacres my enemies so much more effectively than anything I've ever done before. What about this next one? Oh my God, that's like even more like wild and, you know, fills the screen with even more carnage. It's just a never ending. It doesn't look like something I'm interested in. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sure it's great. Then it's on Game Pass. I'm like, all right, let me, oh damn, this is good. Uh, and I went through entirely the same uh, cycle that you did. And and uh, yeah, what a, what, a, what a nice surprise. And again, thank you to Game Pass for just putting mm -hmm. it in front of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an, almost an element of Vampire Survivors to me that's like taking what's satisfying about like clicker games almost about like this there's yeah. element of sort of playing itself mm -hmm. um but I don't mean as a negative um that I just found really fascinating to see in a more action kind of context is that a, a Steam Deck game for you Jordan oh yeah yeah it's, a, it's the one I have that won't just kill the battery and like a Plague Tale Rec game is that that's a sequel to uh, uh Innocence I think was the, the previous I, I game guess so, which I never played and I just said uh, all right there's something new again on Game Pass look at the Look what's happening here. And I was like, wow, this looks really good. I'm a space dragon. Yeah, it was like a <laughs> fairly realistic medieval setting. Later, some magic got into it and it didn't need, I don't think it needs mm. that. Uh, but it's like, all right, as a native New Yorker, this is a recognized like pizza rat times a million. But I was like, wow. And you know, the game's a little on rails, sure. But uh, again, I did a giant rat swarm game you didn't know you needed. <laughs> well, uh, if, if that's not an argument for any people to try it out, I don't know what would be. Um, and then, of course, uh, the last game on here is is uh, Cult of the Lamb. I think it's a, a Devolver Digital uh, joint. Mm -hmm. um, you know that there's uh, a lot of enthusiasm for that generally um, in, in our uh, critic circle. I would play, I think, but I didn't. I played... I feel like that's the theme of this discussion is just finding time yeah. to play the games. I think... Don't sleep. I get, you know that's that's one way to go about it is just Pretend. when the you know the rest of the world is 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 sleeping you're up uh, just gaming into the wee hours of the morning um and I think that's you know, a little sense that some of what all of us would like to do at least some of the time um but I think uh for now we'll just have to call it uh, this has been a, a wonderful time as always. I love doing this every year uh, with you all, and um, I'm so glad that I, I get to do it. Um, so uh, thank you so much to Carolyn, Dan, Jordan, Cherie. Uh, I've been Samit Sarkar from Pop New York Game Awards. Get hype. <laughs>
All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 12th Annual New York Game Awards. It's so great to be back live and in person. My name is Makita Byfield. I'm a senior intern at the New York Video Game Critics Circle, and this year I'm helping to co-host the show. <laughs> Thank you. Right now, I would like to introduce the creator of the New York Game Awards and the New York Video Game Critics Circle, Mr. Harold Goldberg. Makita, thank you so much. Uh, you, you're going to be great tonight. You already are. So this is our 12th award show and our 10th live show. And I am so glad. We're all glad to be back with a live audience. And you look so good in person, man. It's so good to see you in person. Not quite 8K. That's probably because I've got some smudges in my glasses. But, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, right now, I want to introduce your friend and mine, the former president of Nintendo of America, the man as beloved as Mario, as honorable as Link, as delightful as Kirby. It's Reggie fils -Aimee. Thanks, Harold. So the, uh, the love in this room is phenomenal. And as Harold said, it is just so great to be back here in person. You know, this was a great year for games and a great year for me personally as well. My book, Disrupting the Game, was published. And I have to say, it was challenging to write. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Phil Spencer, for that, that applause. You know, the, uh, the, the book was challenging to write, and I appreciate all of you who read or listened to me read it, you know, because for gamers, a book is like an RPG, but with zero dialogue choices, right? So for those of you who put yourselves out and read the book or listened to it, I really appreciate it. And thank you for coming on my quest with me. It was really worthwhile when it made the bestseller list, so it was phenomenal. Yeah. It was, it was an awesome book, Reggie, I, and thanks, thanks for the early copy. And thank you so much for writing about our nonprofit um, in, in disrupting the game. You said joining our board was the perfect role for me. It, it, it was, and it is. You know, and Harold, that's why we're here. You know, yes, there are going to be many awards given and will recognize many deserving game developers. Uh, and Phil Spencer is here to receive our Andrew Yoon Legend Award. Woo! You know, but we're really here to talk about the help the circle gives to underserved and homeless students. That's right, Reggie. It's important that we all come together to help people of diverse backgrounds. And here's a fact. Only 2% of those employed by game studios are black. With our programs, we mentor students to write game narrative and games journalism. And we have them interview top developers on YouTube and the like. You know, we give them paid internships, college scholarships, and pave the way for really significant opportunities and internships at game studios, like our partnership with Rockstar Games and those internships will lead to jobs. So check the QR code on the program that you were given when you came in. Please take the opportunity to make a small donation. We have so much in store for you tonight. Uh, trailer premieres, a trip to the metaverse to f find Reggie, <laughs> Devin Delaquante from The Daily Show, our sought after journalism award, and so much more. It's going to be such a great night. But let's start things off with Whitney Mears from Newsweek, Imad Khan from CNET, and Mike Andronico from CNN Underscored. They are here 
to introduce our eSports Award. So take it away, you fantastic trio. <laughs> <laughs> So, as competitive in-person events began to open uh, back up, it was uncertain if the same storylines uh, that had dominated esports would continue after the pandemic hiatus. What we saw is that some players that dominated pre-pandemic continued to do so in the wake of everything that happened. But what we didn't expect uh, is that players that were in the shadow of the Giants for so long finally stepped into the spotlight. From fighting game champions cementing their legacy to rising League of Legends Valorant stars reaching new heights, every player on this list left their mark on 2022. And the nominees for the Jolton Joe Best Esports Player of the Year are Arslan, Arslan Ash, Sadiq. Brian, Pancada, Luna. Kim, Deft, QQ. Messiah, Amsa, Chikamoto. Alexander, Simple, Kostelyev. Yu, Smurf, Myonghuan. Alright, so let's uh, see. And the winner is. Amsa. Amsa. Hello, I'm Amsa, a Super Smash Brothers Melee Pro player and using a Yoshi, sponsored by the Buji Bootcamp and the Level. I'm so happy to receive such a great award and I'd like to say thank everyone involved in the uh, New York Game Awards. And also thank my sponsors, my fans, and Smash communities. And uh, last year, I won the Super Majors, the Big House 10, that was huge. And also, the, uh, I won the two majors, like the Apex 2022 and the Scout, the Scout World Tour. So I'm pretty get closer to, to get the best player in the world. So now, that this year, my goal is uh, becoming the number one player in the world. And uh, once again, Woo. thank you very much for your support. Woo. Woo. All right, congrats. And now we have our awesome writers, Ronald Gordon and Isaac Espinoza. They've both stepped up big time to help out a mentor and not just one, but two Bronx classes. Ronald and Isaac, take it away. Well, this thing on? Fantastic. <laughs> so here's the thing. There's something so fascinating about mobile gaming. To be quite frank, it's astounding how people continue to innovate the mobile game scene on something as small as our tiny little phones right here. Something that fits so small in our pockets. It's almost as if we're just creating more reasons to use our phones for anything else that isn't a phone. <laughs> Do you use your phone to call anymore? I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to. Mostly I just text and then it's, well it was back to Angry Birds when it was on the App Store, but now it's cats and soup. But those aren't on our list, now are they? They are not. Speaking of our list, here are the nominees for the A-Train Award uh, for Best Mobile Game. Desta, the memories between. Good job. 
Marvel Snap. Point P. Railbound. Wild flowers. And the award goes to. Let's see. And uh. Marvel Snap. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. This means a lot to us. Thank you to our amazing uh, partners at Marvel and Newverse for believing in us and investing in us. We couldn't be here without you. You know, thank you to the New York Press Circle for honoring us with this. It means a lot. We're a really small studio, and you know, things like this go a long way to giving us hope for what we want to continue investing in for the future. Um, thank you to uh, the amazing team at Second Dinner who can't be here with me. I'm really grateful to be here representing you. We put our blood, sweat, and tears and love into this game, and you know, we're so glad you guys enjoy it. Um, and thank you to the fans and the content creators that give us feedback and support us. Without you and going on this journey with us, we. We couldn't make this game. And you know, personally, thank you to my family for supporting me and loving me through this. It's always hard making games. I know all you guys know that. So thank you. See you Woo! both. Congratulations. And now for our Central Park Zoo Award for Best Kid Game. This is the game that delights children and is the worst enemy of all parents trying to manage screen time. <laughs> and, and so we have a special presenter for this award. It's 12-year-old Tani Adewami. He is the wonderful chess prodigy who won the New York State Chess Championship at age eight. Woo! Eight! Woo! He is also the author of My Name is Tani, and I Believe in Miracles, the amazing true story of one boy's journey from refugee to chess champion. Woo. Tani. So the, I say the winner, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, and the nominees are. Okay. And the nominees are. <laughs> Harmony's Odyssey. Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Mario and Rabbids, Sparks of Hope. Woo! Moss, Book Two. Pokemon Legends Arceus. Splatoon 3. Tunic. And the winner is Kirby and the Forgotten Land.
Hello, everyone. PJ from Nintendo. You can go sit down. Uh, Kirby. Uh, Kirby surprised everyone this year when he swallowed a car. Um, <laughs> but we were really surprised as well with just how much love uh, the game received by both kids and everyone. Uh, so we're highly honored that each of you took this journey with Kirby this year. Um, and we'd like to, on behalf of the developers at HAL Laboratory and Nintendo, who worked on the game and the title Kirby and the Forgotten Land, uh, thank you for the award. Congrats, uh, congrats, PJ and, and Nintendo. That was an awesome game. Next up is our Freedom Tower Award for Best Remake, because we all make time to play the best games again, well, in theory, anyway. And if you love a remake, you either have to play these games or see pretty much any movie Hollywood puts out. <laughs> <laughs> to present the award, here's Samit Sarkar from Polygon. Samit. Right. Um, before I start, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Sarah Clemens. Um, uh, my colleague who I usually pre pre present this award with, uh, she couldn't make it tonight. Uh, but we, we miss you, Sarah, and we love you. Um, so I, uh, Sarah and I have been presenting this category for a number of years now, and I, I, love, I love it because it's, it's just very video gamey. Um, you know, remakes are, as, as Harold said, remakes are pretty common in Hollywood. Um, but it, I think it would feel a little strange to, to have a, like a single year in which a number of great ones were released enough to fill a whole category. Um, in, uh, in games, you know, games are, are unique and uh, um, like other kinds of remakes, video games do, uh, uh, they're, they're designed to introduce old experiences to new audiences. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, thanks to the, the ever advancing um, technology with which games are made, uh, remakes also have the power to, to you know, deliver more fully realized versions of uh, the original creative vision behind a particular game. Uh, these five remakes did all that and much more. So the nominees are... Atari 50, the anniversary celebration. Crisis Core, Final Fantasy VII, Reunion. Life is Strange, Remastered Collection. Live Alive. The Stanley Parable, Ultra Deluxe. All right. And the New York Game Award goes to... The Stanley Parable, Ultra Deluxe. For me? Well, I'm truly honored. In fact, I'd rather win Best Remake than any of these other little piddling categories. Oh, sure, it's easy to be loved when you've made something shiny and new, but to excavate a piece of trash from the dumpster of yesterday and trick people into liking it again now, that's what art is all about. Thank you very much. Wow, that, uh, that was some very wry British humor. I think I was just eight years old when the Stanley Parable was originally released. And for context, I'm turning 20 this year. So <laughs> it looks really cool, and I'm definitely going to check it out tomorrow. Now, here's a New York Game Award that appreciates the beautiful art and wondrous environment in game. 
It's the Statue of Liberty Award for Best World. Presenting the award is Dan Ackerman from CNET. Woo! Dan. So companies recently have spent a couple of years, many billions of dollars trying to build metaverse style worlds where video games have been doing this since the beginning, whether it's persistent online worlds, uh, Elden Ring. You say an A. You do agree. God of War Ragnarok. Woo. Horizon Forbidden West. Pokemon Legends Arceus. All right, and the winner is in what might be the first of many Elden Ring. Hi, I'm Eugene Chen, Senior Brand Manager at Bandai Namco. And I'm Milad Sadat, Director of Communications here. What an honor. I think the folks at From Software are going to be really proud of this one given the field of competition. Some uh, real sunk hours in this category, right? Sunk hours, but I think no regrets. Uh, maybe some bruises from the tarnish that brave the lands between. But on behalf of From Software and Bandai Namco, thank you so much for the New York Video Game Critic Circle for this amazing honor. Thank you. I am the witch, Rani. I accept this award as it was written in the stars. My thanks tarnished. This is mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a surprise. Thank you. So it's no secret that I love old 8-bit games like The Legend of Zelda. It brings back great memories for me. And now we have a world premiere trailer for 8-Bit Adventures 2 from Critical Games. It releases in two weeks on January 31st. Let's check it out. That game, that game looks awesome, and, and uh, it even looks better on, on the big screen for some reason. And so, some of you were lucky enough to get codes when you checked in, so let us know how you like it. So, 
Indie games always gives us some really new ideas, gameplay, and narrative. Personally, I enjoyed reviewing Wildflowers and writing about immortality for NewYearGameCritics.com. Now, to present our Off-Broadway Award, give me one second, folks. To present our Off-Broadway Award for Best Indie is our journali Journalism Chair, Nick Capazzoli and Michelle Earnhardt. <laughs> Like that, I'll leave you that one. Perfect. Okay. So, while the AAA space is often where ideas are pushed, uh, polished to a fine sheen, the indie scene is where those ideas are born, and often where they're at their most raw and forthright. This year's crop of nominees have some standout examples of the ingenuity in the indie community, from Neon White's speedrunning style to Vampire Survivor's mashup of twin stick shooters and casino style dopamine rushes. <laughs> you think it's too late for them to change the name from Vampire Survivors to Everything Everywhere All at Once? <laughs> I certainly didn't think my Steam Deck could render that many skeletons without exploding. <laughs> at any rate, the nominees for the Off-Broadway Award for Best Indie Game are... Immortality. survivors <laughs> Wordle Wildflowers Director of Vampire Survivors, a game made by the wonderful souls of Punkle. We'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to the fans of Vampire Survivors from around the world, valiant warriors who have spent hours trying to survive, as well as to all of our partners and the kind people at the New York Video Game Critics Circle. We hope you have a fantastic evening, and we look forward to seeing you in the next run. Congratulations, that's so 90s, right? <laughs> Next is one of my favorite categories, the Herman Melville Award for Best Writing. And George R.R. R. Martin even did some writing for Elden Ring, which probably explains why that game is so hard to finish. <laughs> Here to present the award is Carolyn Pettit from Kotaku. Carolyn, come on up. All right, hey folks. Um, you know, I think when I first played The Legend of Zelda and saw those famous words appear on the screen, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. I, you know, with all their mythic import, I, I knew that writing could be essential to the way that games sort of resonate in our minds and, and live on in our hearts. So it's done me a lot of good in the 12 or 13 years since The Legend of Zelda came out, something like that, um, <laughs> to, uh, to see writing in games become more and more uh, recognized as not something incidental to, to games, to the, you know, the level design and the uh, mechanics and all the other uh, wonderful disciplines that go into making games, but the, as something that could be as, as central to our experience of games as, as everything else. And 
I think this year's nominees, you know, are a particularly strong group. Uh, they demonstrate how fantastic writing can imbue a wonderful world with a sense of history and mystery. They, they show how great writing can take a, a character who's uh, a collection of amazing combat abilities and skill trees and, and, and give them uh, you know, pathos and, and depth. And they show how games can simultaneously transport us um, to somewhere totally new while also speaking very much to some of the most urgent concerns of the moment that we're living in right now. Um, this year's nominees are As Dusk Falls. God of War Ragnarok. Woo. Immortality. Island Road Warden uh, and the award goes to God of War Ragnarok. Good evening, everybody. My name is Verna Velasquez. I'm the animation director on God of War Ragnarok, and I have the honor and privilege to be here tonight to accept this award on behalf of the uh, writing team for Sunny Santa Monica. And uh, I'd like to especially thank uh, Matt Sophos, our narrative director, as well as Rick Joy. And uh, I really thank everybody for joining us in the journey uh, that Kratos and Atreus took across the nine realms. So on behalf of the team, thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. You know, this show takes a lot of work to create. And we started working on it back in February of last year. And it was easier then because I still hadn't found a PS5. Big Circle founder and my good friend, Harold Goldberg. Thanks, Reggie. Thanks so much for being here. So. Um, this year was actually a rough one for me. In, in July, I fell while working on my house in the mountains. And a helicopter flew me to Albany, where I found I'd uh, broken my pelvis in three places, had a brain bleed, a concussion, bruised shoulder and arm and wrist so bad it, it grossed out the nurses daily. <laughs> Plus, there were other things wrong. Uh, for a while, I didn't think I'd make it. And uh, weeks later, I still couldn't close my hand enough to play games. And I had to learn how to walk again. But I'm pretty much better now, and, and thankful. I am so thankful to be here. And the one silver lining is that the injury, injuries like that and the helicopter ride are the closest I'll ever get to feeling like a character in Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very thankful that our work as a nonprofit was able to continue without a hitch. But first, I want to thank Helen Pfeffer <laughs> for her help in getting me through it, helping me to walk with that walker and all that tough stuff. Thank you, Helen. And I, I want to thank those who have supported this nonprofit this year and, and all our work. Rockstar Games, Google, MoM, Devolver Digital, Take-Two, Nintendo, MSK, 
Bethesda Software, Catherine and Jeffrey Soros, Mike Wilson, NPD Group, and IGN. Also, Rob Smith, one of our producers last year, died recently. And, and Rob was a longtime games writer and an expert with video. His book about LucasArts was stellar. So I will miss you, my friend, we all will. And thanks, thanks to John Azalona, our superb creative director, who's back there now. You can tell him by the, the awesome bald head he has. <laughs> Victor Kalagianis and George Jimenez are fast-thinking, longtime directors. Cherie Smith and Mike Andronico, who are stage managers. Cherie. Nick Capizzoli and our Journalism Award team. <laughs> Mentors Isaac Espinoza and Ronald Gordon. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Mark Mayer, Ted Howden, everyone at SVA Theater, our excellent team at Zebra Partners. And yeah, they did such a great job. All of our valued critics, writers, interns, students, educators, and volunteers. And thank you, our, our fans, too. Thanks. Thank you all so much. And now I want to introduce Anne Del Castillo, the commissioner of the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. And everyone has, at MoM has been really supportive of our work with underserved and homeless students. Anne, can you take the stage, please? Good evening. Um, uh, I want to thank you, Harold, and Reggie, and Makeda, for hosting such an awesome evening. Um, but I also just want to thank you, in particular, Harold. It's, I'm very happy to see you tonight. Um, and I want to thank you for your incredible vision um, uh, for video games in New York City. Uh, I want to congratulate you, congratulate you also on 12 years. It's fantastic. I also want to congratulate all of tonight's nominees and honorees, um, and really just all of you for being here tonight. It is a thrill to be in person <laughs> to celebrate di digital games with all of you. Um, you know, this industry that thrives at the intersection of media, technology, art, education, um, new events in the 70s at arcades such as Chinatown Fair, where I myself spent quite a bit of time. Well, my mom would go grocery shopping. I would be there playing Street Fighter or whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, I was not in the competitive games, though. Um, <laughs> uh, new York City has also served, um, as a lo it was served as a location for Nintendo's first ever global retail store in the 90s. And yes, and and of course, uh, the city has also served as the star um, center, star location for a variety of commercially successful game series. Um, and so we're we're proud that New York City um, has really been uh, a place for uh, digital games can call home. Um, as some of you may know, uh, some of you might know us originally as the New York City Film Office. Um, but our mission has expanded over the last few years um, to include support for New York City's create, uh, creative economy beyond film and television, music, theater, advertising, publishing, um, live performance, digital media. These sectors that represent $150 billion in economic output and close to half a million jobs. Um, and I think you know, the pandemic really showed us how critical these creative industries are to the New York City economy. When um, theaters and live performance shut down, New York City shut down. Um, restaurants weren't doing any business. Retailers weren't seeing any walk-in business. Um, but what we also saw um, during that time was the critical importance of video games. They kept us connected and engaged with community. I know that's not news for the people in this room, um, but I, I really think it uh, really reframed the dialogue around digital games. And so in 2021, uh, my office commissioned uh, the first study of, first ever study of the games industry here in New York City. 
Um, and through that study, we found that the industry supports 7,600 jobs and two billion in economic output for the city. And so Mayor Adams, in his first year, uh, last May, announced steps to transform New York City into a global hub for digital games. Uh, we made a $2 million investment in the first ever bachelor's degree program in digital game design at City College of New York City. We also established the first ever Digital Games Industry Council to ensure that we have a sustained ongoing dialogue between the industry and City Hall um, so that as we're shaping policy, as we're doing economic development, that Digital Games has a seat at that table. Um, and then uh, some of you might be familiar with the Made in New York mark, which for many years was what branded our film and television um, production industry here. And so we have um, now extended that mark to digital games. Um, and so we're really proud to celebrate Made in New York digital games. And we'll soon be launching a marketing program which will offer free promotion for, digital, for those digital games that are made here in New York City. I'm especially proud to see a number of the games tonight um, that have been nominated are made in New York. So just a special shout out to those. I won't name you because I don't want to be showing preferential treatment on them. <laughs> um, you know, we are particularly proud to support the, um, the New York Video Games Critics Circle, um, their internship program, which works with Bronx Works. You know, this is a program, as we heard, that connects students to industry professionals and trains them to write about and review and uh, review games and also learn about game development. You know, this work in the Bronx, coupled with the work that um, the Critic Circle does to provide scholarships, social justice journalism classes, and paid internships to underserved and homeless high school students, is really crucial to creating opportunities and advancing diversity in the industry. And I thank you for it. You know, the commitment of the Critics Circle uh, really showed during the pandemic when they pivoted um, and figured out a way to continue the work virtually uh, at a time when the community really, really needed it. Um, and this work was documented in an Emmy-nominated um, public service uh, awareness um, series that highlighted organizations um, in each of the five boroughs that changed course during the COVID-19 crisis um, to support their communities. Uh, the video uh, that focuses on the Critic Circle uh, really traces their work to bring games and journalism to underserved communities through internships and other events programming. And so we're gonna, I think we're gonna show a bit of it here. So take a look, thank you. The New York Video Game Critics Circle is a group of 40 critics and paid interns who uh, come together to work in the world of video games. We work up here in the Bronx primarily to bring games and journalism to un underserved communities. When you're going through a video game, you're experiencing that story for yourself. Video games can kind of give that level of storytelling that some books can't really match. We want kids to have fun, but we also want them to think about what's going on in the game, what the narrative like, what the art is like, what went on in the game creator's mind to move you through a level or move you through a chapter in a game. I think the pandemic in general has really forced us to be more creative and strategic. Bronx was one of the hardest hit areas. It has been challenging to find housing opportunities. School attendance and remote learning in general has been a huge transition for us in the family shelter. Social isolation, right? They're, they're away from their, their school community as well. Their own peers, their own family members potentially. All the typical traumas and circumstances that our families were typically experiencing were exacerbated during this pandemic. This has been wonderful for families to just keep them engaged. Since the pandemic began, we had about 10 interns who write reviews for us, help us with social media. Uh, we also put on every year the New York Game Awards and that is about 400, 500,000 people watching us online. There are so many 
jobs in the gaming industry these days. Writing, drawing, musical, directory jobs. Games are not a waste of time because they are investments in people's future. We're like a family here. That is like my great honor to have a group of kids that feel comfortable and welcome at the New York Video Game Critics Circle. Thank you, Commissioner. When VR has a unique purpose, it really takes you to another world. And tonight, we have a special world premiere. We'd like to take you to a classic venue from the past, Studio 54. <laughs> now, this disco was the playground of the famous, along with whomever the owners deemed cool, rich, or poor. And I even went there once. <laughs> So, so here's the backstory, Reggie. I, I, I'm sitting there finishing a mystery novel called The Skinny, and I'm happily nowhere and everywhere, and the time is like a beautiful nothing. I'm in the zone. And Stephen, my publisher, writes to me about this cool VR experience from a guy in a small coastal town in Spain. It turns out that Jake Uñante has created a virtual Studio 54, and we're premiering it to the world right here tonight at the New York Game Awards. Here we go. But that's not all. So you can go to nygamecritics.com now and find out um, to find out how to go to all space right after the show. So you can put on your glasses. And some of us from the critic circle will actually be there to hang with you. I think Scott Stein will definitely be there from CNET. <laughs> and It'll be decorated in New York Game Awards fashion. And that's right, we're the only Game Awards show with an after party at Studio 54. <laughs> <laughs> and it will feel like the real Studio 54 to your eyes and ears. Not to your nose, though. That's still illegal here and in the metaverse. <laughs> Not only that, if you can find Reggie's book, Dan Ackerman's book, Jordan Miner's book, my book, and even our uh, mascot cat, Laszlo, <laughs> you can win Disrupting the Game by Reggie, and he'll sign it in your name, too. So the, the way this is going to work is the first person to send photos of all four books and Laszlo the cat <laughs> will win the goods. And I'll sign my book for you. So go to nygamecritics.com after the show for more information. That's so cool. And Harold, I have to meet that cat sometime, OK? <laughs> so now, here's Devin Delaquenti, one of the best writers from The Daily Show, to present one of our best loved features at the New York Game Awards. Devin? Devin. <laughs> Hello, hi, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you all. Wow. Um, keep it going for yourselves, keep it going for your hosts. It's going so well. This is wonderful. Um, it's such an honor to be back here with you all in person. Um, it's a bunch of gamers and designers and tech reporters in an actual room, proving once again that Zuckerberg's metaverse is useless. <laughs> if we're not using it, nobody is using it. We all wore the Nintendo Power Glove, and we're like, those headsets look stupid. <laughs> uh, it's a big week in gaming. Video games have now merged with prestige television with The Last of Us. I'm sure all of you watched it, right? On HBO, very exciting. 
Um, this is just the beginning. I am ready for the HBO version of Kirby. <laughs> because he's been doing full frontal nudity for his entire career. He's ready for HBO. He spends all his time sucking and blowing. Get him on the White Lotus. It's gonna be so hot. Also this year, we're gonna get a new Rainbow Six game where you have to sneak classified documents out of Mar-a-Lago and Joe Biden's garage, so that's gonna be fun. Look forward to that. Um, but if I may be serious for a moment. 2022 was also a difficult year in gaming because so many important lives were lost and so many of them were lost by me. In every single game I played, I, I lost so many lives. So um, let us once again together take a moment to honor those lives that I lost. <laughs> Gone, but not forgotten. Uh, I would love to stay longer, but like so many of you, I was just acquired by Microsoft for $3.8 million. So I'm now an Xbox exclusive. So back to your host. Thank you so much. Thank you, Devin. You know, you, you never failed to make us laugh. And Elden Ring had so much fodder for your excellent sense of humor. I, I know I died many, many times playing that game. And now it's time for one of our most coveted awards, the Knickerbocker Award for Best Journalism. It speaks to the importance of the written world in these digital worlds of fun adventure. Here to present it is Jordan Miner from PC Mag. Jordan's awesome book, round of applause for Jordan, that's okay. <laughs> Jordan's awesome book, Video Game of the Year, comes out on June 11th. I, uh, I wasn't going to promote my book, but then they put it in this Virtua Studio 54 thing. So <laughs> check, check that out and check it out. It's coming out. Um, so as video games grow more diverse and mature, so too does coverage of video games. Uh, great games journalism helps us deepen our understanding of games, and the roles that they play in our lives. Our best games journalism nominees include thought-provoking criticism, riveting narratives and personal essays, 
investigations into broken working conditions, and one simple trick that workers can do to maybe improve some of those working conditions. <laughs> I don't know. And the nominees are... Vanessa Angelica Villarreal. Justin Heckert. Christian Donlan. Nicole Carpenter. People Make Games. Edwin Evans Thurlwell. Gabrielle De La Puente. And the winner is... Justin Heckert. You know, I just got a PS5 um, <laughs> and Elden Ring, and I was gonna go home and like start playing it. And I thought I'd done like a great job of avoiding all boss spoilers to it. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'd rather be here, and now I know. Um, anyway, um, thank you so much, Harold, Makita, Reggie. Um, this is, and, and the New York Video Game Critics Circle uh, judges, this is such a humbling honor. Um, for a journalist. Um, I want to thank uh, Claire Howorth at Vanity Fair magazine. Um, she's the executive editor there. I can't believe that they let me uh, publish a story about video games um, in Vanity Fair. Um, and I'd like to thank my wife, um, and I, I want to just make sure I get this right, for <clears throat> nurturing the fact that video games are like a huge part of my life. Um, <laughs> and they always have been. So this story, uh, briefly, um, is about a video game heist, um, but it's really kind of about why games are important to people. And you know, when when they're stolen and taken away, it can be devastating. Um, thirteen years ago, or excuse me, when I was thirteen, um, my parents confiscated my Super Nintendo, um, <laughs> and uh, they did it because I think they thought it was stunting um, my development as a human being. And they also thought it was the reason I was failing Algebra 3. Um, what I learned from it is that I hate algebra, and life is desolate without video games. Um, and so, you know, this story is sort of about that. It's like, what happens when you take away games from people? And, you know, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, I can't believe I'm here. This is such an amazing honor. Thank you. Yeah. Congrats, Justin. And if you hadn't read uh, Justin's story in Vanity Fair, look it up. It, it really is a must read, as are all the uh, nominees work. But wait until after the awards to do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, here's a fairly new award for us, and it centers around the importance of teachers in shaping the lives of underserved young people. And uh, two years ago, we got a note via email from Ryan O'Callaghan at Mott Hall 3 a middle, a middle school in the Bronx. And um, Ryan talked his principal into letting us mentor and giving scholar, college scholarships to these awesome 12 and 13 year old future leaders. They love games and they love writing. And uh, one really cool thing in addition to that is that they are so enthusiastic and so deadline conscious. So I had the privilege of mentoring at Mott Hall 3 with the circle. And I've witnessed the students' excitement there. And that's in large part due to Ryan O'Callaghan. 
So Ryan, please step up to the stage and accept our Elizabeth Jennings Graham Award for Best Educator of the Year. All right, hello. Um, I literally talk all day and I'm never nervous about it, but this is like a lot. <laughs> like you don't go into teaching for awards. Um, you also don't think like Reggie fils and Phil Spencer are gonna look at you while you accept them, so um, wow. Um, just, you know, touching on what Harold had just said, um, I reached out because we were in the middle of a pandemic and I would drive into work, I would have five students in the room with me, the rest were at home, screens were off, playing Fortnite, and I knew that. And I understood that because I was that kid. And to my colleagues, video games were the enemy. And I've always known that they're so much more than that. Um, they're relationship builders. They're storytellers. Um, you know, my brother is here with me. Um, our whole relationship we've built through video games. My fiance is here with me. We met in the middle of the pandemic and used gaming to really foster our relationship. Um, but no one saw that. And as I was driving to work, listening to the 800,000 podcasts I listened to, um, someone, I don't remember anymore, uh, recommended a podcast with Reggie. And I was like, cool, I'll check that out. And then there was this guy, Harold, there. And I was listening. And I'm like, wow, they teach games. That's so cool. Wow, they're in the Bronx. I teach in the Bronx. I'll never be able to do anything like that. Yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> I reached out and Harold was kind enough to respond to me. I did not know I was talking to Harold. I maybe would have been a little more nervous. Um, but you know, after a lot of work and convincing, um, I was so lucky to have all of these people come into my classroom and really connect with my students um, in a way that I've on small occasions been able to connect um, but have it really expanded and built this really wonderful community. So, you know, I just want to thank everyone who's come into my room. And if I forget your name, I'm so sorry. Um, but Isaac and Ronald and Harold, Reggie for coming in, Cherie for coming in a little while ago, um, Whitney as well. Um, it's really been such an honor, and working with you has really revitalized like what it means to be a teacher and an educator. Um, and I can't wait to continue working with you. So thank you all so much. Congratulations again, Ryan. And from the bottom of my heart, as a proud product of New York City's public school system, I just want to say thank you again. <laughs> now, it's time for a special trailer premiere. To premiere it, we have the thoughtful founder of New Challenger, which publishes dope games and culture. Welcome, Sean Alexander Allen. <laughs> Sean and I have uh, known each other for a long time. Yeah, come on right up. Hi. Uh, four years ago, uh, we showed a trailer for a game that was very near and dear to my heart, uh, Treasure and Beat Down City. Uh, we just started working with uh, Open Mike Eagle, and he made a great track for it with uh, Two Mellow and uh, Inverse Phase. And then like, and we were trying to release it in 2019, then uh, uh, I, me and my wife's bombs both passed, my kid was born, the pandemic started, but we were in CERT, so we were able to launch in March of 2020, and uh, like the LA Times called it the most relevant anti-racist game of 2020, and that was like the next game he was going to be reading, playing was the, the Last of Us 2, which was funny, that was the, so we're very proud of that game, <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of funny that um, you know we were able to do that. It's like two people, me and Nico Marcano from uh, we're from New York, and this game is very much about New York. And so over the last few years, we've been able to talk to folks who've been helping us get the game uh, on some new platforms, as well as just to build it into because it kind of ends on a point that uh, we 
kind of heads on a cliffhanger, and we really wanted to finish it, but you know, two people with very little money trying to do it in the city, uh, that's just kind of sucking all of your money for rent and everything, uh, <laughs> was very hard. And now we've been able to up to about five programmers now, and we're back with uh, uh, Open Mike Eagle on to be here tonight, but he's got COVID-19, so he couldn't go, and he's responsible. Uh, so now we're back with Open Mike Eagle and Mega Rand to show a new trailer. Proudly presents your number one source for your current events. Of course, with a little of my comments every sprinkled in. Oh, we got a guest today. Before I bring him in, what's up? Beat down city still wildin'. Run by some tyrants whose lifestyle of foulness. Law enforcement so childish. No one is wrong, but they won't do a damn thing about it. President's gone, a victim of kidnapping. We keep screaming and still nothing happens. Man, it's driving me insane. Making me wanna up and suplex a train. Anyway, when we get back from the break, we gon' meet someone who has something important to say. So grab a little snack, pour something cold, and just cheer to the next episode. Come on. Revolution! I'm televised tonight, cause it's money bag news. With the lies you like, look at the bad news. Fighting on a Friday night. If you call it bad news, you right. I'm providing the coverage for once. Hide the ruckus, and my foes getting wise to the lies they publish. Conflicted interest, some conundrum. They run from the source where the funding comes from. You know what really grinds my gears? When the president disappears, ain't nobody saying shit is weird. We gon' make it all crystal clear with baseball, bass rips, and spears. I got the key to the sun to beat down. Rage on but then reach down, I'm standing on mine to be down. We could meet now, brawl to a pull apart, mess around there, find out we'll bar. So yeah, coming out to Xbox, thank you Xbox for all the help you've been doing with me. Big thanks to Sean Alexander Allen. Thank you. So, you know, we showed you that excellent Studio 54 VR environment. And please go to nygamecritics.com to enter our contest. And now it's time for the best VR AR game. And presenting the award is Cherie Smith, the editor in chief of Laptop Magazine, and Tolly Polanco from Tom's Guide. Hey, Tony, take that mask off. We got a couple seconds to raw dog the air a little bit. Let's take advantage of it. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Uh, five years of presenting this award. Um, one thing is clear. Virtual reality is more than just a passing fad. On the contrary, we're nearly 15 million Quetta MetaQuest Pro 2 headsets sold to become a household item. You could even say it's as ubiquitous as a toaster. <laughs> and uh, as we ex begin to explore mixed reality in the ever-evolving multiverse, whatever it is, because when I was at CES, there was a multiverse of TV, education, who knows what it is? We'll figure it out. Um, VR continues to capture our imaginations and immerse us in our favorite games in ways that consoles and PC never can. So whether you're learning to cook traditional Asian cuisine, pushing the limits of physics, or making a clockwork clone to yourself, VR has something for everybody. So without further ado, the nominees for the Coney Island Dreamland Award for Best AR VR Game are... <laughs> Bone Lab Lost Recipes Moss Book Two Ruins Magus. The Last Claw. 
Rockwinder. And the winner is Moss Book Two. I'm Shauna Sperry, the writing lead on Moss Book 2. I'm Mike Felice. I'm the engineering director on Moss Book 2. Um, Shauna and I are really, really grateful to be here, very excited. Um, and um, we're, we're here to represent Polyarch and Moss Book 2 in accepting this award. Thank you. Yeah, creating games and telling stories in VR is so special and unique because you're able to actually transport players to other worlds and meet characters face to face and form actual connections with those characters. And if those relationships feel real, it raises the stakes of everything in gameplay, which makes uh, the highs of victory even sweeter and the hard times uh, may even just break your heart a little bit. Um, the feelings that Sean is talking about is not unique to just VR. It's actually what we experience as developers in making games. It's the highs and lows as we develop. Um, there's the, the ups and downs, the challenges that you face, and ultimately what we were experiencing, you get to play in mosque in a way, you know? So it's, it's almost like you're with us. Um, and I just wanna say that from a collaboration point, us coming together, we, we feel very proud of the game and for the game to be so well received, um, we're, we're just very thankful. Yeah, um, so thank you so much to all of our friends and family at Polyarch who supported us through all of this, um, all of our partners and collaborators. Uh, a huge thank you to the players who we made this game for, and a sincere thank you to the New York Video Game Critics, Critics Circle. Um, we really appreciate this incredible honor. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats, guys. And if you watched and listened carefully, there were some amazingly nuanced acting in games this year. And we even got to see the great Grace Zabriskie from Twin Peaks in a game. Now, here's the legendary Oscar-nominated Bill Plimpton, who's such a great animator, to present the Great White Way Award for Best Acting in a Game. <laughs> Bill, come on up. Thank you, Harold. I'm very excited to be here. Actually, I, I had to take a break from my making my new film. It's called Slide. Uh, if it's Blazing Saddles was done in animation and Mel Brooks turned an animator, that's what it's going to be like. So I'm very excited about it. So let's look at the nominees for the best actor. Alex Jarrett, was Zoe Walker, as Dusk Falls. Ashley Birch, what I did at the Aloy, Horizon it, Forbidden we West. Did it. it didn't end the threat. It just slowed it down. Be safe. Christopher Judge, Kratos, God of War Ragnarok. But what if Loki going to Ironwood is the only way that he... Oh, Atreus. Grace Zabriskie, Eliza Varez, Death. The Quarry. Death takes many forms. It could mean change, transition, transformation, often interpreted as a, a beacon for the... Justice Smith, well, Ryan Erzahler, The Quarry. Actually, super boring. If you must know, I needed some life advice. Advice, huh? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, Man Engage. Ambrosio. Marissa Marcel. I had outsmarted the Inquisition. In a few moments, I will be a kingdom away from this dungeon. My freedom came at a price. Will you pay the same, Ambrosio?
Very cool. And the winner is Man Engage as Marissa Marcel in Immortality. Hi, thank you so much for this huge honor. Thank you to the New York Video Games Critics Circle and special shout out to Harold, who's always been such a supporter of the game. I love Immortality so much and um, the, the feedback from everyone in this community about Immortality has been amazing. And um, this is a true honor and an honor to be nominated alongside such great performances. And I'm just super thrilled. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'm not Manon Gage. Um, she's a very good actress, but she's not this good. Uh, so I directed Manon in Immortality, so I can only concur with the critic circle that this is a very deserved win. Uh, if you've played Immortality, you'll know that the game uh, wouldn't even function, it wouldn't sing, it wouldn't fly without the depth of Manon's performance. Uh, so thank you, Manon, and uh, thank you to everyone. Um, I want to cry tears of happiness. Manon is really the sweetest, kindest person ever, and I'm so proud of her um, for winning this award. I got to interview her in a series that we did about immortality, um, so check out the website to see what I and all the other interns wrote. All that being said, we're moving on, because now it's time for all of you at home to reach into your pockets and donate. Um, the New York Video Games Critics Circle was very helpful to my family and I when I was living in a shelter. Um, and it's not just me, the Critics Circle has helped so many students um, over the years. And we really enjoy being interns, so please donate via the QR code um, that they, so that they can continue to help others. Thanks, Michaela. So we're so glad that you're working with us. This has been an honor to be up here on stage with you. You're doing a bang up job. Thank you. And now, a hardworking student is about to get a $10,000 college scholarship. <laughs> to hold one of our journalism in games competitions, we chose Ellis Prep in the Bronx because it has a great mix of smart students who recently came to New York City. And they arrived far and wide from the Dominican Republic, Ghana, Yemen, Curaçao, the Ivory Coast, Togo, and Guinea. And that's right, Reggie. We want to thank the good people at Rockstar Games so much for making this scholarship possible. And please welcome to the stage educator Zach Hartsman and scholarship winner Yamin Tikpina. Also a teacher, shout out to Ryan, who just got educated of the year. How's it going? Um, so I'm a teacher at Alice Preparatory Academy. It's a public school in the Bronx for newly arrived immigrants and English language learners. Um, I met Harold here at the New York Game Awards back in 2019, and we've collaborated in a couple of things here and there. And back in September, he told me about this Rockstar Scholarship, where um, my students had the opportunity to write a video game narrative. If they were to create a game, what story would they tell? Um, or a video game review um, that focused on social justice issues. So I've had some students do a combination of these different projects. And I'm just so excited that my student, Yamin, who is heading off to college next year, who wrote a <laughs> He wrote a wonderful story about um, an immigrant girl moving from Togo to the United States and the experiences that she would be, would be dealing with, which will be public soon, so everyone will, should definitely check it out. Um, and yeah, for like educators, use games. I've been using games in my classroom for almost a decade now, and it's just made 
like my students having some such a better time. My, I, my job is just so much more enjoyable when I'm using games. So definitely push for games and education as much as possible. Also, I want to thank uh, my teacher, Hero, and uh, Video Games Helco. Uh, thank you. Congratulations again, Yamin. Now, show of hands, who here loves music? Woo! Yeah, I know I sure do, and I especially love music and games. Here to present the Tin Pan Alley Award for Best Music in a Game is Stephen Totolo. Totolo? Totillo. Totillo! Stephen Totillo from Axio. My, my man, Stephen Totillo. All right, thank you. Um, everybody here, I think, knows that video game music is essential, unless you are one of those heathens who turns the music down so that you can listen to a podcast while you play. <laughs> I may or may not have written an article for Kotaku 10 years ago confessing that I did just that, and I may or may not have received many angry messages from video game composers <laughs> about that article. Uh, but the, uh, you'll see from the games that we're honoring tonight, there are basically two types of uh, games that celebrate and showcase music in amazing ways. We have games that are adventures, where the music accentuates the emotions that you feel as you play, the feelings of happiness or uh, nervousness or, uh, or, or even sadness. Other games are from that great lineage of Beat Mania, DDR, Guitar Hero, Elite Beat Agents, and other great rhythm games. These are games where the music literally makes you move, makes your fingers hit the buttons, move the mouse uh, in, in ways that just make the game all the more fun. So the nominees are. Elden Ring. God of War Ragnarok. Horizon Forbidden West. Metal Hellsinger. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Shredder's Revenge. Tin Pan Alley Award for Best Music in a Video Game goes to Metal Hellsinger. Hello, we're Niklas and Avira, also known as Two Feathers, and we're the composers for Metal Hellsinger. A big, big thank you for awarding us with the Tin Pan Alley Award for Best Music at the New York Game Awards. That's really, really cool. Thank you to the New York Video Game Critics Circle and for all the hard work you do for homey students as well. Thank you to all the people who play the game and send love our way for the soundtrack. We're really, really thankful for all of it. So yeah, again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Congrats, that is one pounding soundtrack and they look so good together, don't they? <laughs> We are so pleased to have this next musician with us. Mike Fernatal has played with everyone of note on the, lower, on the Lower East Side and beyond. The Left Bank, The Monks, Washington Squares, Tom Clark, Handsome Dick Manitoba, Murderer's Row, Loser's Lounge, Bubble, you should all know these bands. <laughs> He's a musicologist who's written terrific album liner notes, and he produced the album 
garage rock classics. Here to play two really cool songs, one of which will make me cry, and one for Phil Spencer that you probably know well, is Mike Fertitel. Mike, come on up. Come on up, Mike. So as Mike sets up, I just want to know, who's, what was your, your favorite game this year? What, what did you like? Shout it out. Elden Ring. Elden Ring, what else? Oh, that's a good one. What, what else? Immortality. Immortality was awesome. Wait, yell hi. Come on, yell. I can't hear you. Oh, someone said melee. Come on, man. <laughs> That's it. Metroid. Metroid. It's all Nintendo, man. <laughs> all right. So uh, let, it, let it lose for Mike Fernotel one more time. We're going to sit down. <laughs> so 13 years ago, I uh, got a message from a band that was reforming who had last played together in 1960s. <clears throat> and uh, they weren't going to have their lead singer, so they asked me to sing for them. So uh, Harold thought that it would be great if I came here and played this song that none of you know that was recorded before any of your parents were born. So <laughs> he said, they'll love it. So you wouldn't want to disappoint Harold. <laughs> This is a song by the left bank. this one.
Thank you so much. Mike, thank you so much, man. You rock as always. And now for our Andrew Yoon Legend Award. Andrew was an early Circle member who was not only a journalist, he was making a card game called Divorce the Game, which eventually came out. But then Andrew died tragically in a swimming accident. So we miss him, and we named our Legend Award after Andrew. Reggie, let's, let's begin. So it's time now to honor an incredible person who has done and continues to do so much for the games industry, my friend, Phil Spencer. I really got to know Phil as he stepped into the leadership role for Xbox in 2014. And whether it was at industry events or trade association meetings, we found ourselves talking about the challenges the industry faced and how our respective companies thought about addressing these issues. And we talked about the importance of culture in organizations and the power of having a range of different perspectives to solve complex problems. Over time, the conversations became more personal about family and future aspirations. Throughout this time, Phil has been a champion. Yes, a champion for great games, experiences, and communities but also a champion for bringing games to more people across the world and bringing positive change to the broad gaming industry. Here's more about our Andrew Yoon Legend Award winner, Phil Spencer, including two previous Legend winners. As an industry, we are most powerful when we come together united by our common love for the art form of games. I think as far as video game CEOs are concerned, when Phil Spencer says that he likes video games or that he plays them, I actually believe him. What is there to say about Phil Spencer? He's the ultimate, sorry from the bottom, now we're here story goes to Microsoft in 1988 as an intern, working on things like Encarta. Remember CD-ROMs? Yeah, those used to be a thing. Phil Spencer has spent almost 35 years working at Microsoft on products as varied as Encarta and Phantom Dust. But of course, it's over the past decade or so that he has truly made his influence felt across the entire game industry. What I appreciate about Phil Spencer is that he thinks like a gamer. If something isn't up to expectations, he's willing to admit it and do what he can to make things right. One thing I really like about Phil Spencer now that I'm learning more and more as a student is that when you get into the industry, you very quickly learn that a lot of the big wigs, as I would say, don't really play games. But Phil Spencer, he knows what he's talking about. His mission is to bring video games, interactive entertainment, to anyone and everyone on the planet who might be interested in them. His tenure at Microsoft has been defined by that project, to bring video games to more and more people. Through it all, he's always been a loud, passionate champion for gamers. Not just for the gamers, for the people who create games. Whether you hear stories of him playing Ultima Online back in the day, or him showing up on stage in a Battletoad shirt, uh, there was just something about the energy that he brought and the energy and excitement that he brought with him everywhere he went and there was just like, like, wait a minute, is the person in charge of Xbox actually a gamer? Since we're here tonight honoring Phil Spencer, it would be great if we could say that he kind of invented the metaverse. Now we can't really say that, but he was instrumental in Microsoft's acquisition of Minecraft, which is really kind of a proto-metaverse. 
Now that happened way back in 2014 for $2.5 billion. And you may not believe this now, but back in 2014, $2.5 billion was actually kind of a lot of money. The legacy of Minecraft at Microsoft and Phil Spencer is all about unifying platforms. It's about honoring creation and persistent universes. He, he brought like a new energy back to, to, back to Microsoft and back to Xbox. Halo is one of the most iconic franchises in gaming history. Master Chief is one of the most recognizable characters on the planet. I mean, who doesn't have stories of playing Halo in their dorm room all throughout college? But the Xbox business that Phil Spencer built, it's all about respecting players and respecting creators. Community has always been the foundation of any gaming console. Phil Spencer and Xbox have always continued to innovate that field. And no better is that seen, in my opinion, than the creation of the adaptive controller. And of course, arguably Spencer's most successful initiative has been Xbox Game Pass, which has completely changed the way people consume games. I would not be as big of a Monster Hunter fan as I am to this day, if not for it being on Game Pass come 2018. So I'm of course thankful that Phil Spencer is the reason for a lot of what Game Pass has to offer. Uh, we had an Xbox at home when I was growing up and my brother basically never let me play it. <laughs> We'd been in an all Nintendo family before that and Xbox really changed the game for us. Without Halo, there wouldn't be a legacy of taunting your enemies with a very, very specific taunt involving tea. What is the legacy of Minecraft and Phil Spencer's acquisition of it? I just heard that Minecraft videos have been streamed more than one trillion times on YouTube. It's essentially open, it's cross-platform, it's an antidote to the walled garden ecosystems that everyone else spends all their time trying to build. Phil Spencer has always kept one thing clear. Gaming is supposed to bring us together, not push us, to push us apart. And that's why he's deserving of this Lifetime Achievement Award. You may know Phil from Minecraft, Halo, and Forza, but he's been involved and created so many more games. And tonight I want to congratulate him on earning his Andrew Yoon Legend Award this year. Combined, these programs have reduced Microsoft's reliance on selling boxes that cost hundreds of dollars just so people can play games, and they've reduced people's barrier to entry in order to get into video games. Phil, I, I went down this awesome rabbit hole when researching your early life, and I found that you grew up in a really small town called Ridgefield, Washington, and uh, you played soccer there and, and, and uh, were a sputter, which is kind of the character of uh, all things sports in Ridgefield. And I also noticed that Sputter character is a lot like Sal Sputter in Cuphead, so I just wondered if um, someone from the Cuphead team was actually growing up in Ridgefield or it was a coincidence. But I, I wondered if it was that small town essence that led you to stay so long at Microsoft. Maybe it was a, a loyalty that you maybe only get in small towns these days. Congratulations, Phil. It is great to see you being honored in this well-deserved way with this award. Um, I've uh, worked in the same circles as Phil for roughly 20 years. And in that time, I can tell you, he has always been a man of his word, a very outstanding character and someone who believes deep down in doing what's right for games and gamers and developers all around the world. So I want to say thank you to Phil for all your years of hard work and support. And I'll tell you one little story. I once tweeted um, about Judas Priest. Well, I many times have tweeted about Judas Priest, but once I did it, um, and within seconds, Phil Spencer replied with another reference to Judas Priest. And so what that tells you is, first of all, uh-oh, Phil Spencer is following me on Twitter. And secondly, Phil Spencer is an unapologetic metalhead, which is all you need to know about him. Trustworthy to the core. So with that being said, congratulations, Phil. Hi, Todd Howard here at Bethesda Game Studios. I want to congratulate you, Phil, on the Andrew Yoon Legend Award. So well deserved uh, for all you do and all you've done for the billions of gamers around the world and those of us who create the games. So it's really not just a congratulations on behalf of everybody in the industry, 
It's a thank you. Thank you so much for all you've done for us, Phil. And I know there are bigger and better things ahead for you and Xbox. Uh, and I can't wait to see them. And mo more importantly, play them. <laughs> Congratulations on the Legend of Word, Phil. So thank you, Phil, for 30 plus years at Microsoft, always thinking about the next big thing, and congratulations on your award. Congratulations, Phil Spencer, on earning this Legend Award. I'm more than happy to say congratulations to Phil Spencer for winning the Legend Award. You full well deserve it. Phil, congratulations on receiving the Andrew Yoon Legend Award. Thank, thank you, you Phil. But I think also there is a, a trend with our Legend Awards. It certainly, like Reggie, there's an empathy you have. You talk a lot about joy in games and wanting the consumer to have pure fun while player, playing. So I think that all goes back maybe to that small town feeling that you have an empathy in you like Reggie does, like some of our other Legend Awards winners have. So perhaps that's part of the reason in addition to being a smart businessman is why you have thrived at Microsoft. Whatever the case, it's been decades and there've been so many games as our interns have pointed out and our members have pointed out. So I just wanted to say, Phil, congratulations on getting our Andrew Yoon Legend Award. Enjoy it and enjoy your continued tenure at Microsoft. So please give a big New York welcome to my good friend, Phil Spencer. Thank you. This award is particularly meaningful given the awesome history of previous recipients, many of whom have been sources of inspiration, feedback, camaraderie along the journey of my career. I know I speak on behalf of all of us when I say that the 2021 and 2022 recipients of the Andrew Yoon Legend Award have given us so much joy over our lifetimes and certainly their work sustained us all through the pandemic. I feel sad that we weren't able to celebrate in the room together. So please join me now in finally celebrating them in person, us here in person, Hideo Kojima, Jerry Lawson, Brenda and John Romero, and Tim Schaefer. There have been so many moments of wonder in my career, and certainly this great honor of receiving the Andrew Hume Legend Award is one of them. My sincere thank you to the New York Critics Circle, to my team, my family, and all of you. And most of all, every single player around our, the world who has found joy in what all of us here do, building worlds for others to discover and delight in. I've been working in the gaming industry for a long time. And well before that, I was a player and a fan of games. Back in those days, as a kid, we would save up every penny from our allowance to buy a new game that we probably chose based on the picture on the front of the box. <laughs> we knew that this was going to be the one game we got to play for the next six months, maybe even a year. We hope we picked the right one because we were all about to get to know that game extremely well. With that one precious game, you were all invited into a new world. A new world that was created with groundbreaking engineering work, innovative artistic vision from the game designers and developers behind that cartridge. Holding that cartridge for the first time was a rush of excitement and anticipation and playing it pure and utter joy. Not just because we owned a cool thing, but because of the experiences we would have with that game and the community. We didn't just play with family and friends. We talked about it, obsessed over it. We laughed about it 
and sometimes cried over it, reliving our best and worst moments together. Gaming was and is about this very echo effect of joy. Today, there are so many games, more than ever before, available to more players than ever before. But also, it can feel like there is more despair in the world, a steady stream of bad news. With the ongoing leapfrogging from crisis to crisis, it feels to me that that joy I experienced as a child has become much more elusive for us for all to find, more of a guilty pleasure. It feels like today, seeking joy is an act of defiance. Yet, yet today as creators, as leaders, as world builders, our greatest responsibility to ins is to inspire and invite joy. Each one of the hundreds of titles that players have at their fingertips today and tomorrow is a calling card for joy. Halo, God of War, Vampire Survivors, Peppa the Pig, big games, small games, mobile games, indie games, each one is to design to deliver an infusion of joy in the midst of our lives. To give us so much joy, people want to talk about it, to share it. We, all of us here today, all of our teams around the globe, we are all part of creating this echo effect of joy. Our creators who bravely and intentionally release their visions to the world, particularly in the current culture of criticism and cancellation, our players who bravely and intentionally carve out time for our games to invite, rest, and rejuvenate their lives. And business leaders, we are called upon to have the courage to protect and nurture this collective joy. We are called on to incubate these experiences, create them, and grow them, to seek and surround ourselves with a multitude of perspectives, to honor our differences across experiences and geographies, and to practice empathy when intentional lead listening to others. We turn away from dividing players and creators and instead towards each other as we advance and amplify joy together. This is the echo effect of gaming joy. Thank you for this honor tonight and th thank you all for making the brave choice to put joy in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Phil. Such a cool man, um, and I'm so happy to have you here on this stage with us. I know it's everybody is truly honored to be in your presence. And if, if anybody deserves this Legend Award this year, it is you. So congrats again. Yeah. So I know everybody in the audience is excited for Game of the Year, but we have two important new awards this year before we get to the big one, okay? All of our awards have New York-centric names. So we have Chumley's, which was a hidden speakeasy in the village. Here's the Chumley Speakeasy Award for Best Hidden Game, and here to present it is comedian Gabe Malika. <laughs> Gabe is actually uh, one of, Gabe's one-man play solo is a New York Times critics pick and is now running at the Soho Playhouse. Please give it up again for Gabe Malika. Hey everybody, how we doing, we're good? Hell yeah. Uh, first of all, Reggie, if you need a PS5, I got a guy. <laughs> I, I got a PS5. I, I need an Xbox. You need an Xbox? Okay. <laughs> I, I, and I know a guy. That's good. My guy's in Suffolk County outside of Chili's. But um, <laughs> if you got cash and a Mad Cats controller, he can hook you up. Um, thank you for having me. I'm doing a show off Broadway right now uh, called Solo. It's a show about not having any friends. <laughs> so they're like, <laughs> they're like, you want to come to the Video Game Awards? I was like, these are my people. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Most of the show is about how I play Discord every night with my buddies, and I don't know anything about them. <laughs> my mom was like, oh my God, you talk to Nick every night. Nick's sister just had a baby. How does Nick feel about being an uncle? And I was like, what? <laughs> how does Nick feel? I, I know how he feels about Star Fox. <laughs> I know how he feels about Pokemon Snap. <laughs> but I don't know any of the other stuff. 
Uh, I'm very excited to uh, announce the nominees for, for this next award. Uh, this is the, uh, the Hidden Gem Award, and I relate to that a lot because I'm a comedian with an off-Broadway show, <laughs> and none of you have heard of me. <laughs> and you're all well-dressed, so nobody's getting a promo code. <laughs> the nominees for the best hidden gem are... A Memoir Blue. Norco. Patrick's Parabox. Perfect Tides. Signalis. Strange Horticulture. The Case of the Golden Idol. Wayward Strand. And the winner is uh, La La Land. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's Signalis. Hi, everyone. I'm Sun here on behalf of Hummel Games and Rose Engine. The Rose Engine team were a bit shy to accept the award themselves, so here's their message. Thank you so much for the award. We are deeply honored and humbled that Signalis has struck a chord with so many people. We would like to thank our friends who have supported us so much throughout the years. Thank you to our publisher, Humble Games, our musicians, and our partners that helped with the release, and everyone who has, helped, who has played Signalis. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, son. Uh, there's so, you know, when we announced uh, the nominees for that award, there's just uh, an outpouring of, uh, yeah, Signalis on Twitter. So it was, <laughs> I guess it was uh, fate. You know, we haven't done a downloadable content award before, but those wonderful add-ons are often deep and compelling as the original game. So now here's our new award, the NYC GWB Award for Best DLC. It is presented by a man who's been blocked on Twitter by anyone who's anybody, Matt Nagrin from The Daily Show. He's also known as The Goose. <laughs> Nobody remembers me without The Goose costume, I guess. Uh, I'm here to present um, Best DLC um, because I am such a fan of DLC. Not just in gaming, but the DLC that exists in the world all around us. You know, when you think about it, a DLC is a room in your house that you didn't know was there. <laughs> it's a friend of a friend who sometimes is better than the original friend. <laughs> it's finding out you have a three-day weekend because of Martin Luther King. It's a second term for a president you don't hate. It's Puerto Rico. And it's the 100% completion achievement, but for video game developers. That's why I'm such a big fan of DLC. Down, loadable content. It should probably just be called DC. But why is that extra L in there? That's DLC, baby. <laughs> the nominees for best DLC are... Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Dawn of Ragnarok. Bug Snacks, the Isle of Big Snacks. Dead 
Destiny 2, The Witch Queen. Microsoft Flight Simulator, Top Gun Maverick DLC. Monster Hunter Rise, Sunbreak. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Tombs of the Fallen. And the winner is Destiny to the Witch Queen. <laughs> Hey all, my name is Blake Battle and I'm the project lead for Destiny 2 The Witch Queen. It is an honor to accept this award on behalf of the teams at Bungie, and we really wish we could be there with you tonight. As a lover of pizza, I feel incomplete that I've never been to the birthplace of the world's definitive slice. Like New York's pizza, Destiny 2 has become the world's definitive FPS action MMO, and The Witch Queen, an example of Bungie's ability to deliver a first-in-class gameplay experience with a story that continues the promise of a meaningful, evolving universe. First, I'd like to thank the teams at Bungie. While it's just me accepting this award, there are hundreds of people across dozens of disciplines that bring the best of themselves every day to create this experience for our players. Second, I'd like to thank the New York Game Awards for the recognition this evening, as well as for the good causes you support and stand for. And finally, I'd like to thank our players. The soul of destiny is in the communities that you build around it. And your love of the game is what inspires us to bring more of it to you every year. We are not going anywhere, and we plan to inspire generations of Guardians to come. And do not forget, in a little over one month from today, on February 28th, Destiny 2 Lightfall, the penultimate chapter in the Light and Darkness Saga, goes live. With humanity's backs against the wall, it is definitely one of our most exciting rides yet. It's a great time to return to Destiny, or pick it up for the first time. We'll see you Starside Guardians. Thank you. So, <laughs> now it's time for the big one. And, uh, and my body is ready. How about yours, Harold? <laughs> my body is ready too, Reggie. <laughs> Audience, is your body ready? Yeah. Critic Circle critics, can you come up to the stage? Come on up. So it's tradition for the newest member of the circle to present the Big Apple Award for Game of the Year. So here's Adam Siddiqui from Gaming Access Weekly and IGN. Adam? Can, there you are. When you're ready, can you please do the honors? Hello, everyone. The Stand Among Legends is quite nervous. <laughs> but the Game of the Year is one of the most prestigious honors that a game can achieve. And while each one of these games deserve that award, there can only be one. It's unfortunate, but it is the truth. And the nominations are Plague Tale, Requiem. Cult of the Lamb. Elden Ring. God of War, Ragnarok. Immortality. Pentiment.
Vampire Survivors. <laughs> Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And the Big Apple Award for Best Game of the Year goes to... Elden Ring. <laughs> This is amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for the New York Video Game Critics Circle for the 2023 Big Apple Game of the Year Award. We want to dedicate this to our very talented friends at From Software, as well as our colleagues at Bandai Namco. It's an honor to receive this prestigious award, and from an organization that not only recognizes the best in our medium, but helps move it forward, mentoring young students, some of whom might be standing up here someday, accepting this very same award. So thank you, Harold. Thank you, New York Game Awards, for your efforts. Thanks. Finally, all the pieces are in place. <laughs> this is mine. All mine. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's about it. Just about a wrap. Congratulations to all of the winners and nominees. What a stellar night. Uh, but don't forget to donate at New York Games Critics Dot com. Yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, Ronald and Isaac, you got to go out there because you, they have a couple of buckets. Those who had free tickets to the show, college students, throw a couple of bucks out there as you leave. Um, I had a great time tonight, um, but do, do, please do drop a couple of bucks in the bu buckets. And Makita. Thank you all so much. We'll see you all next year and have an awesome 2023. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, those of you who have tickets to the after party, you can head out there now. Those of you who don't, thank you for coming to the show. Uh, for, for, uh, for our legend winners, Phil, can you come up here? Todd, you want to come up here? We'll get all take a picture together. And also, um, if you're a nominee, after Phil and uh, Reggie and Bikita and Todd and I take a picture, if you're a nominee, come up and uh, be great to get your picture as well. Okay. So you take a picture with these guys? Yes. Great. Of course, that won't accept the incident agreement. Yeah, can you put them in my uh, uh, piece of luggage? Uh, it's a big piece of luggage. The okay. only big one. Thanks.